If you ever want to lead somebody in your life, you got to learn how to be led. And one of the ways to how to learn how to be led is in school. That's one of the earliest places we learn that. And ultimately on this podcast, I want to always tell you, you got to lean into the hard things, not away from them, not run from them, not say it's too hard because you didn't say it in this email, but I would, if I was with you in the cab of the truck and we were talking about this, I would say, be honest with me, Spencer, you're saying it's too hard. You're too weak. You're telling me you're too weak and this is too hard to finish school. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast, episode 165. Thank you for watching and listening wherever you're coming from, wherever whatever platform brought you here and wherever you're listening. I appreciate you so much. I love doing this. That's why I've done so many, because I keep coming back because of you guys, because your, your questions are so great. That's what we do on this podcast is I answer your questions questions. Email me, grangersmithpodcast at gmail.com. And it could be about anything. Just like me and you are sitting in the cab of a truck driving down the road and we're like having a conversation. And and you're like, hey, Granger, could I, could I ask you something? Something's been on my mind, uh, something I'm going through. And I'm like, hit me. And we talk about it in long form. That's why I love the podcast as opposed to a quick clip on, you know, social media. This is, this is the full form. I'm going to give you everything that I could think about. I don't have any notes in front of me. Um, I haven't pre-planned answers to your questions. Uh, we're just going to go through the inbox and see what you sent. So here we go. Subject line of the first one says school slash work. Hey, Granger, this is Spencer. I'm 15. I live in Florida. I love your music. Your song country things is probably my favorite. Thanks, buddy. I just recently got a job and I don't really see the importance of school because school doesn't pay me. And I feel like I have a good general education and I don't want to be a rocket scientist. I just want to go grab a chunk of land and live off of it. So why focus on school when I could have more hours and make more money and actually start getting somewhere in life? Thanks, Yee Yee. Spencer, thank you for the email, buddy. And the fact that you're 15 and listening to this podcast, I just appreciate that. I'm, I'm always surprised a little bit. Uh, I, I don't think I ever started this podcast directly towards young teens. But um, as, as I started posting uh, clips up on TikTok, I started getting more of it. And I'm just, I think it's amazing. And, and I think it's, it's a, a, true, a true privilege for me to be able to speak into um, young teens, mainly because I used to be one. And I used to be a really dumb one. And so anything I say that, that might sound out of tough love, uh, I want you to know, um, for instance, you, Spencer, I want you to know that I'm speaking to myself because I once was you. And I want to point out the first thing to anyone listening uh, that I, that email I just read had no punctuation in it. So that's kind of a, it's kind of an, an ironic point here. Uh, the entire paragraph had no punctuation in it, um, which, you know, may lead me to say that maybe school is not a bad thing uh, just for punctuation's sake. But let's dive into your, your question, Spencer. Um, and, and you know what? This question is just as much related to parents. So parents of young teens, I think this question is great for you to, to hear too, okay? And here's what I want to say. Spencer, you have no idea what you're talking about. And not, not that I do. I just, I've lived three times as long as you, essentially. So um, I remember being 15 and I remember thinking, what's the point of school? Well, the, the first point that you're missing is that school is not always about what you learn. It's more so about how you learn. Learning how to learn is a big piece of school. It's a, that's a big, it's a big component to school. It's learning how to learn, setting your eyes on a goal and, and setting forth to, to meet that goal with all kinds of requirements and then fulfilling all the needs and meeting the goal and finishing the race. That's a big deal with school. But like it's it's not so much about actually specifically the facts and the skills that you're learning. And I know that sounds crazy. You're like, that sounds counterproductive. Well, 
that's really a big deal because those of us that have finished high school know that when we got that diploma, we're like, man, that was probably the biggest deal I've ever done in my life. That's the biggest accomplishment so far that I've done in my life. And I'm, I'm not saying that lightly. That's what the high school diploma meant to me. I might not have known it at the time as I was going through classes. A lot of it I just didn't like. A lot of it I thought was pointless. A lot of times I thought, I just want to sing music. What am I doing school for? I just want to play music. This is crazy. What, what in this class am I learning for my life? Nothing. That's what I kept saying to myself. But I didn't realize what I was doing. I didn't realize that I set off to accomplish a goal and I had to meet all these intricate requirements over the course of years. And when I finished it, I thought, I did it. I did one of the most meaningful things I've ever done. I finished a high school diploma. There's that. That's where I'll start with. Uh, The other thing I'll say is that you have no idea down the road, how many years down the road, you have no idea where you're going to be and what you're going to be doing. You say right now, I'm just interested. I don't want to be a rocket scientist. I get it. But you say, I'm just interested in living off the land. And well, that's what you said. I just want to grab a chunk of land and live off of it. Man, I get it. (laughs) So do I, bro. So do I. When I was 15, that's a huge goal. And uh, then things change. You get things like a wife and you get things like kids and you get things like responsibility and you get things like, uh, you know, leases and mortgages and payments and things that you got to do. And that's a beautiful thing. That's life. Those are beautiful things. Uh, and, And part of that argument, I would say, hey, stay young, stay uncommitted for a while and just enjoy it while you can, because guess what? It's coming. You're going to fall in love. You're going to meet somebody. We'll probably answer a question on this podcast very soon about just this. But when that happens and you got a wife, you got kids, you got responsibilities and you got a job that you enjoy. And then one day your supervisor or your boss is going to promote you. And then they realize, oh, you don't have a high school diploma. Like, well, you gotta, we got to promote the other guy that does. Sorry, Spencer. I didn't realize you never finished high school, but that's kind of, that's, that's the requirement to become a supervisor in this company. Dude, I know that sounds foreign to you right now. I know you're not even thinking about being part of a company, but more than likely you will. And this is the time to do it because that's not the time to do it. The, the, the time to not do it is when you're 35 years old and you go, man, I, I'm up for the supervisor position, but now I got to go get my GED because I was an idiot when I was 15 and I didn't finish. Finish the race. School is not always about what you learn. It's about how you learn. It's about learning how to learn. Here's my final point. You are using this lifestyle of living off the land and being wild and free and school is worthless. You're using that argument as a cop out because school is boring and you don't want to do it. And it's kind of hard and you got to get up early and you got to read and you got to fall under the authority of the rules of the school. It's all things that a 15 year old kid doesn't really want to do. I mean, let's be honest. When I was 15, I didn't even want to brush my teeth much less get out of bed, much less comb my hair, much less put put on shoes. I just wanted to run around in the dirt all day and hunt deer, wild hair and unbrushed teeth. <laughs> That's part of being a man. If you ever want to lead somebody in your life, you got to learn how to be led. And one of the ways to how to learn how to be led is in school. That's one of the earliest places we learn that. And you also learn how to be around females and other guy friends. And you learn different kinds of skills. These are all things that you are using as a cop-out because it's hard. And ultimately on this podcast, I want to always tell you, you got to lean into the hard things, not away from them, not run from them, not say it's too hard because you didn't say it in this email, but I would, if I was with you in the cab of the truck and we were talking about this, I would say, be honest with me, Spencer. You're saying it's too hard. You're too weak. You're telling me you're too weak and this is too hard to finish school. So you're like, I just want to be a, you know, on the land. It's a cop-out. It's a cop-out. I know it's tough love, but I would say this to you to your face, and I would say it in confidence, knowing that I could say that to myself at your age, and I probably would have needed to hear it. Finish 
school. You will not regret it. 50 years from now, you will not look back and say, I wish I hadn't have taken that advice from that podcast and finished school. It meant nothing. You will not say that. But you would regret if you don't. Trust me. I probably spent way too long on that. Let me move on to the next question. Subject line says, any advice on this? Dear Granger Smith, I prefer to stay anonymous. Last year, my fiance and I were expecting a baby. Unfortunately, both her and the baby didn't make it. I haven't been the same since. No matter what I do, I can't stop myself from thinking about them and what my life would have been. I know it's not easy. Is there any advice you have for me on perhaps starting to live my life again? Is there a way that I can get past this? Thank you. Yeah, anonymous. Um, thanks for the email. Thanks for opening it up. Thanks for being vulnerable. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I can't can't imagine um, losing a love of my life and a baby in, in the same day in the same moment. And I'll say this. I would say this. In the course of human history, your story is very common. You want to know how I know? Because I've visited cemeteries. Have you ever visited a cemetery? I think it's important in life to occasionally visit a cemetery. I get such good perspective going to a cemetery and, and just walking, walking. And that might sound morbid. That might sound weird. But I don't do it out of some kind of strange, sentimental, weird vibe. I, I genuinely do it just to go and, and think a little bit. It relaxes me, honestly. And I could go through, if, say I'm in a new town and I'm on tour playing music. And I go to uh, grab some groceries for the bus. And if I see a cemetery and I have time, sometimes I'll take a stroll through it and just read some of the names and look at some of the dates. Think about all the people. And I think about how many funerals were there and how many people stood around those graves and cried and mourned. And then within just a few decades, they too were right there in the ground with their loved ones that they once mourned for. It's a crazy thought until a hundred years go by and the entire family's there. And they're all together, their earthly bodies in the grave. It's, it's a strange thought, but it's healing in a way. And to get to your point, so many times you see a mother and a baby buried next to each other because that used to be very common. Meaning that there's a lot of dads out there like you, billions of them, I'm sure, over the course of history that lost their wife and their child in childbirth. And what did they do? Always. They moved forward. They continued to move forward because that's the only direction they can go. There is no reverse. There is no neutral. They move forward. They go on with their lives. They don't have to move on. They don't have to forget. They don't have to put it out of their head, but they use that and they store it up for gratefulness and they keep moving forward. You said, is there any way that I could learn to live my life again? You said, no matter what I do, I cannot stop myself from thinking of them. Well, first of all, here's this. First of all, you said last year. So you're just a year in. You're, that's the first thing is it takes time to heal. Time is going to be your friend. As time goes by, as months go by, as years go by, you'll start to slowly heal through this. That's inevitable. You're going to heal. And when 10 years goes by, you're going to look back and, and it's, it's, it's not going to be easy to look at it, but it's, it's going to be better. It's going to be better, way better than you are right now a year in. It's really tough where you are. The second point I want to make is you say, no matter what I do, I cannot stop myself from thinking of them and what my life would have been. That's a mistake. I'm not blaming you for it. I understand that sentiment, but I'm telling you don't do that. Because why do I say, why do I say don't think about what your life would have been? Because that's impossible because it didn't happen. There is no what your life would have been 
It is only what your life is because that's what happened. And this is where you are. If you live a life thinking about what would have been, you're only living half a life of what you're supposed to be. And what you're supposed to be is embracing who you are right now today in relation to all the circumstances that your story has brought you today. So you are who you are because of the stories that have shaped you. And this is who God made you to be with these stories, with the adversity, with the highs and the lows. That's what makes you who you are. That's what makes you tick. That's what makes you, ironically, anonymous, right? I would say your name, but that that wouldn't make sense because you asked to be anonymous. You are who you are because of your stories and everything that made you. So there is no life that would have been with them. Instead, there is a life that you learned from them that you'll now take to your next relationship as you move forward. And don't worry about rushing that. It's going to happen when it happens. Don't even think about it. Right now, you could just grieve. It's okay. The date's going to come up when, when it's the day that they died, and that's going to be a tough anniversary. And you're going to think about it on Thanksgiving. You're going to think about it on Christmas. You're going to think about it on major holidays. You're going to be more sentimental to it, but that's okay. Whatever you feel at the time is okay. Just keep moving forward. Just like all those graves, just like all those fathers before us, before you, they made it. Humans have overcome unbelievable tragedy, and you will too. Next question, subject line says, meeting a new girl. Hey, Granger, I'm 24 years old from a small town in central Illinois. I'd like to stay anonymous. There's this girl I've been talking to on FaceTime, Snapchat, and on the phone. I've never met her because she's living in California, but I already have strong feelings for her and want to meet her. But my siblings and some friends say I shouldn't go out there to meet her. I'm just wondering if you had any advice. Hoping to hear from you. Keep the good work coming on the podcast. Thanks, Anonymous. It's, it's funny. Um, it's, sometimes it occurs to me when people ask to be anonymous when your, sor- your story is so specific. I'm, w- I'm wondering, like, you're 24 years old from central Illinois and you're talking to a girl in California on Snapchat. Whoever's listening that wants to know who you are, they know who you are. Um, just kind of throwing that out there. But um, I appreciate you trusting me with something like this. And here's what I'll say. You're, you're talking to her. You've never met her. What's it going to hurt? What's it going to hurt to go out to California for the weekend and visit this girl? Because then you'll know. Then you don't have to worry about it anymore. You're going to know or you're not. Um, now, there, there, I want to say a couple things about that. First, do not go alone. You're going to go with a friend. Maybe you're being catfished in a weird way. I don't know. It's hard, it's hard, be hard to catfish on the FaceTime, but it's possible. Go with a friend. That's just good. That would be a a man of integrity would travel with a friend anyway to see a girl. And you would not get a hotel and you would not stay with her alone, et cetera, et cetera. Let's assume that that's the way this goes down. Um, It's going to be a nice dinner and movie and tell her to bring a friend and your friend has someone. And, you know, it's like a double date, a double blind date, essentially. The second thing is going into this you apparently know her well and you've talked to her. You're going to have a good conversation with her, a very open conversation. It's like, hey, I want to come visit you. I want to jump on a, I'm going to, I'm going to roll over to Chicago. I'm going to roll over to Midway. I'm going to get a Southwest Airlines flight over to Burbank or wherever you are. And that's, that's not a very expensive flight. I fly out of Chicago all the time. Maybe, maybe you can get one for under a hundred bucks, right? I'm going to, but I'm going to go out here. I'm going to fly under to see you. But before I do that, I need to know something. Okay. And then, then it gets really serious, right? Like pin going to drop. It gets so quiet. And she's like, yeah. And you're like, I really like you. And if I fly out there and I find out that it's legit and we have something, where do we go from there? Like, would you be open to moving to Illinois? Or do you need me to move to California? I'm just saying, and she's going to be like, oh, you know, she's going to get embarrassed. And you go, no, I'm I'm serious. I know this sounds crazy, but I'm a planner. And she could respect that. Like, I'm a planner. I don't just do things. 
and just hope for the best, just throw it up in the air and see what sticks. I want to know, like, say five years down the road, are we living together in California, married with two kids? Are we, are we living here in Illinois, married with three kids? Like, where do you see this going? And if she says something like, well, first of all, I'll never move in Illinois ever. I hate that state. I would never leave California. You got to admit that's kind of a red flag. So it's like, okay, mental note. She hates my state. <laughs> or what if she says something like this? You know what? I think you're a great guy. And, and I just want to be uh, with somebody that I love that I think could be a great father to my children and a great husband. And if that's the case, I'll move wherever. It's like, okay, really like, I like that. That's a check in the positive box. Just saying, those are some conversations that you got to, whenever you're dealing with a long distance relationship on the phone only, you have to hit them with some hard questions that you would not normally say on a first, second, third date. But you got to, because you don't want to waste money on a flight and get out there and actually like her, find out three months later, she hates Illinois. She hates your family. She doesn't ever want to get a job. She's lazy whatever. It was all just infatuation and you fell for it. Okay. You don't, you don't want to find that out after you've invested these plane tickets and these dinners and you, a lot of time, right? Does that make sense? So lay out some ground rules, ask the hard questions early, take a friend. And then I say, what's it hurt just to go out to California for a weekend and see what's up? Worst case scenario, you travel and eat some good almonds or something. You know what? Let's take a break. Be right back. Podcast is brought to you guys today by Omaha Steaks. You ever wonder what to get that person for Christmas that has everything and you don't know what to get them that they'll truly use? Well, how about Omaha Steaks? We were gifted this by our in-laws a few years back, and I remember getting those steaks and just thinking, now this is the greatest gift because you could put it in the freezer. It's flash frozen, vacuum sealed, and ready to share with the family. And and they have this 100% money back guarantee on every steak. It's really the perfect gift because you're definitely going to use it. And you're definitely going to use it to bring your family together and sit around the table and break bread. So the steak experts at Omaha Steaks have put together a special curated gift package to help take the guesswork out of gifting and make you the holiday hero. Go to omahasteaks.com and take advantage of 50% off site-wide, plus use the code GRANGER at checkout to get an additional $30 off your order. Send an assortment of mouth-watering favorites guaranteed to impress like the legendary butcher's cut filet mignon, air-chilled boneless chicken, ultra-juicy burgers, and even easy-to-produce comfort meals that are ready in a flash. Omaha Steaks is ready to ship your order right away, so shop early and beat the shipping rush. Go to omahasteaks.com and use the promo code GRANGER at checkout. Omaha Steaks, really, it's a, it's a gift from the heart. It's a gift that will be remembered with every single unforgettable bite. Order with complete confidence today, knowing that you're ordering the very best. Visit omahasteaks.com, 50% off site-wide, plus use promo code Granger at checkout to get that extra $30 off your order. Minimum order may be required. Podcast is also brought to y'all by Raycon. Another great thing to talk about for the holiday season. You were coming up on the holidays, the happiest season, right? Well, let's be real. Between hectic holiday travel, stressing over getting that family recipe just right, and dealing with that uncle's politics. Yeah, that's just wrong. But the last thing you want to do is worry about finding a great gift for everyone on the list. So in the spirit of giving, I'm sharing my go-to gift idea, and that's premium audio products from Raycon. Raycon's wireless earbuds headphones and speakers offer premium sound useful features and almost custom comfortable fit and up to 54 hours of battery life that really helps me when i'm traveling on an airplane which i travel on a lot of airplanes i need extra battery life i need something to get me through that next podcast or next album that i'm listening to or next audiobook whatever it is sometimes it's just rain noise to help me go to sleep i need that extra battery life raycon delivers it and you know as the person gifting them 
You got to love that they start at literally half the price of other premium audio brands. How cool is that? You know, we put out an album last month called Moonrise, and I listen on my Raycons, and it represents exactly what I hear in the studio. I mean, the quality is that good. And for the next month, Raycon's going to have a countdown to Christmas with a new pop-up flash deal for you to take advantage of every single day. You could also find Raycon in stores like Kohl's or Walmart, but let me tell you right now, it's always good to get the best deal at buyraycon.com slash Granger. The Raycon website offers free shipping, free returns, and buy now, pay later options, plus a 30-day happiness guarantee, and you don't have to go wait in line at the mall. I hate that. So right now, go to buyraycon.com slash Granger to get 15% off site-wide with the code HOLIDAY plus free shipping. That's code HOLIDAY at buyraycon.com slash Granger for 15% off your Raycon purchase. Buyraycon.com slash Granger. Back to the podcast. All right, back to the podcast, back to the questions. I'm going to jump into this one. It says, hey, Mr. Smith, I'm Mike D. I'm from countryside, the countryside of southern New Jersey. I'm 21 years old. I've been welding going on for three years now, and I struggle at times with being patient and trusting God to get me where he wants me. I'm curious on how you trusted his process when you first started your music career, when times seemed slow or rough. Thank you for your time, and thank you for your music. Yee yee, Mike D. Appreciate the email, Mike. Thanks for the question. It's a good question. And I want to I want to really uh, nudge you on this. I want to dig in. In fact, I don't even know what I'm going to say, but I'm, if me and you were riding in the truck, I would ask you a couple questions. I would say, why do you think God is... is pushing you through this welding career. Why do you think why do you think I would think God was pushing me through a music career? That's something I would ask if we're in the cab of the truck. There's no right or wrong answer. But I say that because you say I'm curious on how you trusted his process when you first started your music career when things seemed slow or rough. So how do this is what this is what I would say now. I don't know what I thought back then because I wasn't necessarily a believer. I wasn't a new creation. But I would say now that God takes us through slow or rough times purposely. That's what the Bible says. He's sovereign. He ordains everything. So I would say he willed the slow and rough times for me. As opposed to, it sounds like what you're saying in the email is that, or, or maybe you understand that, <laughs> but it sounds like you're saying uh, God didn't want you to be in, in the slow, rough times, and he's kind of waiting for you to come out of it. So I would say God needs us to go through rough times, and it's up to us to realize who he is through his revealed word in the Bible. We find out who he is in the Bible. And you say you struggle at times with being patient and trusting God to get you where he wants you to be. I could tell you exactly where he wants you to be, and that's with your nose in the Bible. Because that's where he speaks. That's his ever-living word where he still speaks today. And so you get your nose in that Bible, and you go, all right, God, cup of coffee. I'm up early before the sun. I'm starting early here in Matthew 1, chapter 1, verse 1. All right, God, I'm going to read. Reveal to me your precious word. Reveal to me right now what I need to see for my purpose. Fulfill for me your purpose in me. Your will be done, not mine. And you start there. I mean, that's a really good place to start. That's a really good prayer and a really good place to start right before the sun comes up to kick off each day. And you do that every single day. And do that for a year. And I would be very surprised after a year, you do that every single morning. I'd be very surprised if you walked away and said, I still have no idea what his will is for my life. 
I give you a spoiler alert. He's going to tell you in there that his will for your life is to take the gospel to all nations and make disciples. That's his will. That's what he needs from you. That has nothing to do with welding. Welding's, welding is just a vehicle. It's just it's a tent making business for you. Um, it's either funding you know what you need to be doing, or it's uh, introducing you to people that you work with, or it's it's bringing new clients to you, or it's getting you in front of new people that you're. But but all of it is to make disciples of all nations. That's his will for you. That's just a hint, but I, I would ask you to dive into it. Get your nose in there. That's what you need to be doing. Next question. Another young teen. I love this. Email says, hey, Granger, I'm 13 years old. I'm a boy from a rural rural part of Michigan. And I have, uh, for the last year, went through the loss of my grandpa, who was the father and dad to me, because my parents are divorced. So me and him did everything together, hunted, fished, my question for you is how do you find happiness when I know everything is not okay? Question comes from Iden. And through your 13-year-old language, Iden, um, you asked a very profound question, and I love it. And um, it shows a depth in you, Aiden, that's, uh, that's amazing, way ahead of me at 13, because here's what you said. How do you find happiness when you know everything is not okay? Right? Like, that's the question. That's the question of life. How do you find happiness when things are not okay? So th- think about that. Let's unpack that. If we were in the cab of a truck, we would drive down the road and we'd say, Aiden, let's unpack that. Tell me that again. How do you find happiness when you know everything is not okay? And I would say, well, maybe happiness is not what you're seeking. Maybe happiness is not attainable if everything is not okay. True. Then maybe there's another word for what you're longing for, what you're yearning for. And I would say, it's joy. So let's replace happiness with joy because happiness happens to us. Happiness comes and goes. It's fleeting. It happens. You could walk outside and it's a sunny day and the sun hits your shoulders and the warm breeze hits your face and you go, I'm happy. And then five minutes later, a a rainstorm comes and blows your hat off your head and you step in a puddle and you go, I'm not happy anymore. It's gone. (laughs) So let's replace the word happiness with joy because joy is something far more eternal, far more deep within you. So I'm going to re-ask your question. How do you find joy when you know everything is not okay? Mm. Now we're digging deep. Now we're having a good conversation in the truck. And I want to say, first of all, um, congratulations on knowing that everything's not okay. Like that's the first battle, I would say. I would say, Uh, recognizing that everything is not okay is something a lot of people can't do. A lot of people think it's just something's wrong, but they can't can't place exactly what in their life is falling apart. It's like everything, and that's a problem. That's where depression starts setting in. When you go, my life seems okay. Everything seems to be put together, but I'm just not right. Okay, but you're not saying that, Aiden. You're saying, you see the brokenness because you lost directly related to the loss of your grandpa, who was a father figure to you because your parents are divorced. So there's the problem. He's gone and things are not okay. And it's okay. I, it's okay to not be okay. You know why? Because you lost your grandpa and you loved your grandpa and he was a dad to you and he taught you everything. And he was a great man and he loved you. And you're grieving him. And it's okay to not be okay. Let's establish that right now. And here's another thing. Let's use that word happy. It's okay to not be happy when things are not okay. That's normal. 
Don't let anybody tell you, snap out of it. You should be happy right now. You, you know, wipe that frown off your face. Don't let anybody tell you that because whatever you're feeling is right when it comes to grief. So you got to let some time go by. And as time goes by, you'll start realizing, realizing some more things. And this is a lot for a 13-year-old, Iden. This is a lot, but I love that you're asking these right questions. Now, here's the, here's, let me wrap this up. You can have joy and not be okay. You could have joy and grieve. You could have joy and mourn all at the same time. And that comes from realizing that you are a child of God, that you have a heavenly Father who has chosen you, who loves you, who cares for you, who is watching you, who has planned for you, who knows exactly what happened to your grandfather and has a plan that he will enact on you and he will fulfill his purpose in you. Knowing that you're not worthy of that. Knowing that you don't deserve that. Now that that just overflows with joy. Going, you know what? I lost... The one thing on this earth that I love, my grandpa. But I have something greater than that. I have a heavenly father that I'll never lose, that will reunite me with my grandpa, that I will see again. And I'll learn not to ask why instead of what. What do you need me to learn from this? Now, this, this kind of thinking takes a long time to unpack, but the end road of this, what you'll discover as you, as you go down this path is you will have joy and it's okay to have joy and not be okay. And that's how you move forward. You don't get stuck. You don't want to get stuck in your grief, stuck in the mud or you just can't get out. That is the road to depression. Let's hit another one here. Subject line says, searching for young Christians to grow with. Hey, Granger, my name is Katie. I'm 23. I've moved to Chicago a year ago from Pennsylvania. This past year, I've been shown the beauty and struggle of being in the early 20s. I'm searching for a Bible study or a worship group of young Christians in my area or virtually, uh, or virtually who are relying on their faith to guide them through this time of uncertainty and remarkable change. Do you yourself have any advice on navigating the identity crisis that comes in your early 20s and figuring out God's plan for you from relationships and friendships to family and work, Katie? All right, cool. Thanks for the question, Katie. Um, what, what identity crisis are you talking about? As a Christian, you're going to find your identity through your creator. Not in a way that you define it or that anyone else defines it. Let's clear that up from the beginning. Um, and second of all, figuring out God's plan. You know I've gone through this on this podcast. You don't have to figure out God's plan for you. Did you know that? That's not a burden you have to carry. You don't have to figure out what God wants to do with you. Like, what's the mystery, God? What mysterious plan does God have for me? I hope that one day I'll just figure it out. Now, how awesome is it to know that you don't have to carry that burden and figure that out on your own? Now, what you can do, what you need to do, what you should do, what you're designed to do is pull out your Bible. It's our instruction manual. This is an ancient book, but it's trustworthy. And it goes back thousands of years with over 40 different authors written over the course of over 1,500 years written by eyewitnesses in the presence of other white eyewitnesses, fulfilling ancient prophecies claimed to be divine in nature. Now, we could trust this book historically and factually and archaeologically. Archaeologically. What's that word? I don't know. That's way, way too big a word for me. Uh, but you could trust this book in all those kind of ways. But that's that's kind of beside the point here. You You could trust that book spiritually by opening it up and reading it, right? So you you discover through reading that book that God's plan for you is written there. Sometimes we read a book, most of the time we read books and 
we try to figure out what they're saying. We read the Bible and we figure out it already knows us. It already understands us. And it's a crazy thing that uh, you could only find in those pages. Like I said earlier to that guy, get your nose in the book. Um, so let's be more practical here. Besides that, you say, uh, do you have any advice on navigating this remarkable change in your early 20s? You moved from Chicago, uh, from Pennsylvania. Okay, so I got a guy from the Chicago area that's in love with a girl from California I could introduce you to. He's 24. <laughs> I'm just kidding. He's anonymous though, so we don't know how to find him. But but maybe you could email in and, and we could hook you guys up. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, kind of not kidding, but kind of. What if what if in this podcast we uh, we were, we became matchmakers and people emailed in that we're trying to find somebody and they actually found each other because they both emailed the podcast? That would be interesting. Um, you said you're searching for a Bible study or worship group of young Christians in your area who are relying on their faith to guide them through this time of... Un- oh, I know what you're talking about. You're talking about uncertainty as far as like viruses and stuff, aren't you? Maybe you are. Listen, what about a local church? That's like the place to go to find Bible studies and young Christians is a local church. And if you go there and there's not any, you go to another one. Chicago is full of them. I know many in Chicago. There's there's probably a thousand. There's probably a thousand in Chicago. Now, there's not a thousand good ones, but uh, I think that'd be a great adventure on Sundays to do a little research before you go. Check out the About Me on the, the their website, on the church website. Uh, read about them a little bit and go seek it out. That would be a great adventure and a great way to meet young people. Uh, and I don't think you can go wrong. You'll, you'll end up landing in the right spot. Saturate that idea with prayer. Let's grab another one. doing the random scroll here on Grangersmith podcast podcast at gmail.com. And this one came up subject line, breakup confusion. Hey, Granger, longtime fan. Uh, saw a concert in Oregon last year. It was really amazing. Recently broke up, uh, recently broken up with, but where I have trouble is the way that it happened. Okay. I'm listening. And then we got a list of bullet points here that you put. And it says one month ago, everything was amazing. One month ago, boyfriend got second job to pay off truck and buy a house for himself, us. Started working 60 to 75 hours a week, drinking, exhausting himself, and using alcohol to cope. He shuts down often, so I tried to be there for him and support him, and no luck. Randomly breaks up with me that same week when we had been working on some issues, like there was nothing wrong, but then his excuse was he needed to find himself, be happy again, live in his early 20s. He told me the door is still open. He needs a break for a few months. He didn't say break up till I told him to clarify this. Do I take your past advice from episode 161 or is that a different case by case? I'm racking my brain because I thought this was the one together, two years, eight months only started acting like this after that new job. Thank you, Granger. Love and blessings to your family. Happy holidays. Um, Did you say your name? You didn't. You didn't say your name, but that's okay. Uh, Thanks for your sweet words, and thanks for the the question. Um, I want to say, I don't, don't, I don't necessarily remember what I said in episode 161. I don't necessarily remember what I said in the first break of this podcast, episode 165, because my brain is all over the place. Um, but I don't think it's going to be different. So let me shoot from the hip. He broke up with you because he says he needs to find himself and be happy again. Poor guy. The poor guy just wants to be happy. Can you blame him? He just wants to live in his early 20s, find himself, and be happy. Man, that just sounds like a a bad poem waiting to happen. Um, Here's the deal. 
I know that this sounds crazy because you guys dated for two years and eight months, and it seems like it's coming out of nowhere. But what I'm willing to predict is, although it seems like it came out of the blue, he has been acting and hiding this for several months now, and he has finally gotten tired of acting like he's into this relationship. And that's what happens when when someone's like deeply in love for a long time, and then all of a sudden, boom, they're out, like they no longer want to be in it. That just means that there was a transition period, pretty good transition period time when he was just acting. He realized his love was starting to fade, and so he started kicking in the acting gear, and as it faded more, and he started acting more, and it faded more until it got unbearable where he couldn't act anymore, and he said, you know what, I can't do this. I can't do it. And then he probably sat there for a couple weeks, and he said, I got to tell her, 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 I can't fake this anymore, I can't act like this anymore, I got to tell her. And finally, one night, he just said, I got to tell you something. I got to break up with you. I want to go on a break. And I need to find myself and I need to be living in my early 20s and I need to, what what else, what else? Oh, I need to uh, be happy again. He's like going down the little checklist. Listen, I don't mean to, I don't mean to sound harsh on you and I want to respect um, your feelings, but at the same time, I want to give you tough love because I want to, I want to shoot you straight so that you could recover quicker and you could heal better and faster. Because if I just, if I give it to you soft, you're just going to hang on to him. But maybe it has to do with this new job. Maybe it has to do with him drinking and exhausting himself and using alcohol to cope. Um, maybe he was actually getting the job to pay off a truck and buy a house for you, or maybe not any of that. Maybe that's just that all was a facade, and he's been fading. And he, as, as he started fading, he decided to get a job that kicked in more hours, thinking maybe that would save it. And... When that didn't save it, maybe he started drinking because he still was losing love. And then when alcohol didn't work, he drank more. Like, that's very possible that that's what happened. But the bottom line is he's out. And you're going through all the facts in your head. You're replaying all this. Like, what did I do wrong? What could I blame? Like, your brain wants to blame something. It wants to identify like, boom, that was the moment that he took the job. The job is what killed our relationship. Okay. And like you could deal with that. You go, there's the moment. But it's harder to deal with, he just fell out of love. There's nothing you did. And there was no catalyst. And it wasn't the job. In fact, it was all a facade. And he was acting. Listen, I might be wrong about all of this, but I got a pretty good hunch. Because I've... I've lived it. I've got a pretty good hunch that that's where his head is. But it doesn't really matter because he's out and you need to trust his words when he says, I need to get out. Do you want to be with a guy that says, I just need to live in my early 20s and be happy again? I just need to find myself. You want to, you want to be with a guy that has lost himself? No, you don't. No, you don't. I don't even know what that means. I don't know what that means. Um, but there's a better guy for you. There's a guy that will not lose himself. There's a guy that will not drink himself silly because he's just trying to hide his emotions about you. There's a guy that won't work 75 hours a week because he just would rather be home with you. There's a guy that wants to spend his early 20s with you. There's a guy that's when he's with you, he's happy. I'm just saying. There's that guy out there and you're going to find him and it's not this dude. Don't look at the two and a, two years and eight months. Don't look at it as wasted time. It's not a wasted time. You learned a lot. You learned what to look for in the next guy. You learned for what warning signs to see. You learned what red flags are. You learned that it might not be as easy as you think to find the spouse that you want to spend the rest of your life with. And that's okay. It's the search and you'll find him. That's all we got. Love you guys. See you next Monday.
Thanks for joining me on the Granger Smith Podcast. I appreciate all of you guys. You could help me out by rating this podcast on iTunes. If you're on YouTube, subscribe to this channel, hit that little like button and notifications bell so that you never miss any time I upload a video. If you have a question for me that you would like me to answer, email grangersmithpodcast at gmail.com. Yee yee.